So I think that's kind of like to me, it's uh, it's very much relatable in terms of like getting that holistic view of like the developer advocacy, the impact on the users, like using the product and you know understanding the actual like domain space and you know what you should do, as well as like proactively uh, and I think empathically understanding how to help users with this uh, in a real realistic way. Welcome, fellow avocados, to Developer Advocast, a podcast where we learn how the proverbial guacamole is made directly <laughs> from some of the most prolific dev advocates around. My name is Jeremy Hess, head of DevRel at Achilles.io. And since you've already heard me, I'm Sharon Zisman, the bane of Jeremy's existence <laughs> and his jokes. Uh, I like to call myself the chief manual reader at rtfm.dev. And we plan to bring you every two to three weeks uh, new episodes, and we'll be interviewing some awesome folks. We'll be joking around because that's what we enjoy to do. And, you know, bringing, uh, you know, really great topics that we want to talk about in the DevDell sphere. We hope that you subscribe on Apple or Spotify, and uh, please give us a five-star rating. Here we go. Here goes nothing. Welcome back to Developer Advocast. And today we have some special guests who we'll introduce in just a few minutes. And today's episode is going to be around the idea of user zero, where we talk about how dev advocates usually are the first to start testing out new products, new features of products, and then you know starting the feedback loop from there. But before we get into our guests and all of that, Sharon, how about we give some community shout outs? Of course, yes. So we always like to give kind of a good word to the good things happening in the community. And this time I want to give a Shout out to Rosie Sherry, who has this incredible blog. And the last post that I read of hers was about um, how to start a community and uh, create a surround system. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Uh, Rosie, who heads up community today at Orbit, and she was formerly at the, she built the Ministry of Testing community, which is uh, super awesome. She's killing it on the community front. She shares like really great resources on her blog, in her newsletter. She was on the podcast console. Um, and she like kind of speaks about this concept uh, in her last blog post about like how to create a surround system. And I found that so to be true, that totally resonated with me because like, if you think about the organizing team of DevOps days and Jeremy uh, and uh, cloud native and open source, you know, I feel like we always brought a friend on board and a friend brought a friend and, uh, and slowly but surely we kind of built this uh, surround system where everyone's kind of surrounding themselves with their own kind of people and community. and. We came together kind of around that. And even our guests today, like Liran and Philip, have come through our community. Uh, Philip was brought in by Ori Cohen, who we used to work with at Cloudify. And Liran brought in Carney, who brought in more awesome people. So I feel like that's like really resonated with me. Um, and so with that on that note, you know, I'd like to introduce our guests. Uh, Philip Crane is a developer advocate at Elastic. Say hi. Hi. We're so happy to have you here. Awesome. And Liran Tal, who is the director of developer advocacy at Sneak and a GitHub star, our very local GitHub star. We're very proud of you. Everyone. Yeah, so today's a big day in the Tel Aviv community, the Israel community, where uh, three out of four of us are from. It's Purim, big day, big day for the kids, uh, which is the Israeli equivalent of like Halloween. Uh, what do your kids dress up as? Uh, without getting into the without getting into the religious <laughs> side of of what we're celebrating, and you know, it's it's that typical thing they always say about you know the Jews, like you know, oh, we we fought a war, we won, let's eat, or we fought a war, we lost, let's eat. So <laughs> this time, this time, this time, we we do the dress up stuff. Uh, yeah, actually, my oldest is uh, dressed up as some sort of like tiger cat type of thing, and the little one went with Harley Quinn, which I'm really oh. proud of some great photos. I'd love to share them. Uh, pretty badass. So <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. What about you, Sharon? Yes. Sharon, you tell us what your All kids right. dressed up. So I, I, with my youngest, I kind of broke, like I'm a, a terrible parent and I will put it out there. He went like in the squid game outfit that I, <laughs> so many people are doing that. Of. I could not talk about it. I'm like, this is not an outfit for you. And that's what he went with. And my other kid is actually pretty funny. He went with one of those blow up costumes where it looks like the alien is picking up the kid. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. For pictures, so that was fun. And that's um, hardcore. Yeah. Liran, what were your kids, uh, what were your kids up to? <laughs> Um, well, what they don't tell you about Purim is you think it's a one day event, but really it's, it's true. every day of the week they dress up to something else and it's like a different party or whatever. So uh, it's it's a lot. Um, so mine's got uh, a Minecraft 
um, costume. Oh, and nice. It was nice. It was nice. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of uh, logistics to just build the whole thing, all the outfits. Uh, but um, did you build just it got yourself? That. Look at a super parent. Like he's super. No, no, like, they, they, they didn't build that. Stars, a parent star. <laughs> okay, no, yourself. <laughs> okay, please lower the standards, yeah. Iran. <laughs> So, well, Philip, <laughs> well, okay, Cleron, go finish your thing. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I was gonna say, uh, so we've got Minecraft and we've hit uh, uh, the nail on um, uh, a pirate today. That's what we got. Oh, cool, uh, pretty common. Love it. So, we want to ask Philip though. So, obviously, you're in Austria and we're in Tel Aviv, so we have the dress up thing. Are there any such holidays or any days in Austria where you guys do dress up? I mean. We do have carnival, which was just pretty recently. And, you know, in Vienna, you have the ball season, which is not exactly oh. dressing up, but it's also kind of dressing up because you have this <laughs> white tie thing and long dresses and everything. So I, I feel like this is like the adults took it over um, to dress up in their own weird way um, or <laughs> own traditional way. <laughs> That's cool. Love it. Very formal. <laughs> I like it. Have to learn, we're going to have to learn more about that. Yeah, I, I have that. Um, so... Um, <laughs> I, I actually dance like a proper Viennese, so I, I have that's that and I can right. dress up too. Oh, look at that's that. amazing. Let's, 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 get the, let's get the videos. We want the We're videos. Gonna, <laughs> <laughs> we gotta have an episode about that, a dedicated episode to Viennese uh, waltz. Dancing. Yeah, waltzing, I love dancing. it. Do I know? I know nothing. Okay, cool. So let's uh, actually move on to the content of our show. It's going to be a good one. Um, we want to talk to our super awesome uh, dev advocates here who are. Um, come from an engineering background and more of like kind of a, the go deep aspects of DevRel where they become domain experts. Um, so just, I guess, to learn a little bit more about what it means to be a de developer advocate in practice and the things that you do in your day to day, what really falls under your domain and responsibility? Go with Philip. Well, a lot, right? Philip? Yeah, I, I like just trying. want to say like, it, it's very hard to say like, oh, it's, it starts here and it yeah. ends there. Um, because I think my, my day basically starts like seeing like, um, is anybody unhappy out there or what, what are the problems people facing? And then they're also kind of my problems. And of course, then you <laughs> want to get your own new stuff out there or what you think is exciting and what you want to get in front of the audience. Um, so I, it's very hard to say where, where stuff starts and ends, but we have, for example, a community Slack and people might say like, Hey, I don't like this. I need that. Um, I, this is broken. Um, and you then try to figure that out. Or obviously people love to complain on social media. So you have some um, tweets, but at least I'm always like, at least they're trying to tell you what is broken and then you can mm -hmm. try to fix it. So I, I think it's, it's not so hard to kind of like get the feedback. You just need to tweak it the right way to make something actionable out of that. So for me, that's very much like a, what do we want to do as a company? Um, but it's also very important to figure out what do our users actually want to do and where are they? Um, so we can have that match and alignment because it's very easy to run off kind of like in the wrong direction uh, and then kind of like forget what your audience wants and does. And you need to kind of like keep reintegrating them constantly. Otherwise, the PMs have some great ideas and they run off, um, but that might not always necessarily i don't want to give the pms a bad rep here but it might not align with what everybody else in your community is out there or what their priorities are so you kind of like need to reintegrate it constantly that's interesting because yeah. it also talks about like kind of the dual feedback loop so you're right in the middle you get kind of the feedbacks from, from developers you bring it to the product and then you you know spread the gospel outward again that's interesting yeah i mean that. I think that's very much in community, very much the, this two-way communication. You you want to show what you can do. So people kind of like move with you, but then you also need to bring it back to kind of like keep the company moving in lockstep with what the community does to some degree. So you don't have this mismatch uh, in development. Interesting. Yeah. And I think as, as the product grows, that also like becomes a very hard problem, just like because there's like a lot of moving parts. How do you connect everything and where does it fit? Is also one that's and sometimes I think that, yeah, I'm so sorry. Sorry, that, that the company has like a, a specific vision and it's not so clear to the community, and then they're like, uh, I, I don't want to do this or I don't need this. And then you're like, Well, let me show you why you kind of like need to make these connections. Yeah, that's uh that's really interesting. Do you have anything you want to add earlier on on things that you feel like uh you also do or you also focus on just kind of so we get a three six? Is there anything you don't do? <laughs> 
That's true. Um, I, I think developer advocates just wear a lot of hats and in general developer relations is just like such a big domain. And, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to just particularly like work on one thing because it is, it is a lot connected. It's anything from education to experience, like a, just a bunch of things. Um, so I, I'm kind of like going always the path between essentially awareness and creating educational content, community driving all of those stuff and all the way back into engineering and like, how do we, how do we build something cool? How do we build something that's helpful for developers and all of those stuff? So, uh, it's always that back and forth between that. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually following on up on, on what you just mentioned about engineering versus, you know, community activities. What would you say is sort of like the, you know, the, the focus you fo focused a little bit more on engineering stuff? Or are you focusing more on outbound, you know, developer success type of activities? I think it depends. Um, it depends on like, what are the goals uh, that we set for maybe for the team or, you know, for, for the company. Uh, but essentially what we've done before is we have dedicated some resources out of the devil group to basically work on engineering projects. So we had people specifically dedicated on building stuff like, a VS code extension that's helpful for developers. So essentially it is kind of like a developer success thing because we are actually helping developers with what we do on the, on the IDE. Um, so yeah, it, I, I think it kind of changes. These days we actually have a, a devrel engineering kind of, uh, kind of a department here at Snake. So there's like dedicated work just on that. Awesome. Philip, well, we'll go to you as well. I think for us, the we're not doing so much core engineering, but we are very often the, the user zero. So we, we have a new feature out there and we, the, the engineering team might even come proactively to us and say like, you're normally the first ones to use this. Um, please start using this and tell us what you don't like. Um, so we are very much in this feedback loop that engineering often builds something and then they're like, oh, we would love to have somebody use that and give us feedback. And then you probably also have like the connections in the community to spread this out a bit more just to get that early feedback. Um, for example, we have recently replaced our Java client. I don't want to say again, but kind of again. <laughs> and and um, the, the engineering team there was then very keen on getting feedback. Like, is this doing what you need? And then we, we wrote some, some apps and like we have some of our own production apps. And then we talked to users just to, to get that feedback and say like, this is missing and this doesn't look right. And this makes the migration hard um, just to keep everybody in sync because engineering sometimes has great ideas and they run in some direction, but then it might get very hard for the migration, for example, and that will make our lives and the community's lives much harder. So it's kind of a, a fruitful combination, I would say, of uh, staying very close to engineering. And I think that sometimes there's this discussion, should it be PM or engineering? And I think for us, it's kind of more engineering um, where it's really that that's where the, the stuff is actually happening and that's where we want to be in. That's an interesting thing you note, and uh, just kind of a side note, you know what the difference is between a good question and a great question? <laughs> a good question is, is coming, a great question is the next one, and you really just like wait right into what we wanted to ask about, so I like that. Um, <laughs> nice. But, uh, yeah, so in the, in the context of what you just spoke about, um, it's interesting because, yeah, there, there's always that question of like, where does uh, developer advocacy sit within the organization, do you think? Um, that's also influenced by, you know, how technical the product is. Like Elastic is obviously a very highly technical product. Um, do you think that that has a direct influence on where you sit and I, where you're closer to in the organization? I think so. But also, so I've been at Elastic for a long time and I've been all over the organization. So we were a dedicated DevRel team initially. Then we were broken up and I was part of an engineering team. Um, then we were part of product, then product was dissolved and put back into engineering. And I was part of the community <laughs> team in engineering. And then they took uh, community and moved it to marketing. So I have been everywhere and I, I kind of have, have the connections everywhere. But I think engineering is kind of where our own heart is, but also we're kind of like where our level of integration and like where we have the best impact, um, or at least for me, or maybe that's because of my background. That's awesome. Um, so on the same context, so he brought up user zero, um, which to me means kind of like do dog fooding the company products and creating kind of the first examples, QAing and production, you know, trying out like kind of the new features versions. Uh, how does that look like in practice for you, Liran? And tell us a little bit about how like kind of you try things out and then kind of bring the feedback into the organization, figure out quickly what's working, what's not working and try to communicate that. I definitely. 
So I think that uh, user zero, customer zero, depending on kind of like the context, but that's essentially, I think that's not just providing the user feedback. It's also essentially uh, providing that feedback that comes with the form of a developer centric perspective, right? Because essentially anyone can provide a feedback and product managers can try to think, you know, what would be the feedback and have some, some sessions with people. But um, what you really want is kind of like someone who actually goes, uh, you know, in the shoes of someone else that's having using that problem. And I think it's also not just specifically um, an engineering thing. I think that actually um, definitely spreads between engineering is part of it, uh, using the product, but also using the product is going through the documentation. A lot of time it's that. And even I'll, I'll even stretch it beyond that. Like I'll, I'll give an example. One of the things I've seen recently is that we we, we do some sponsoring uh, for newsletters at Snake. So we have we have that sponsored link in it. And I actually clicked that uh, like two weeks ago, I think in like the, the Node Weekly or the JavaScript Weekly editions. And it actually landed me on like a sneak kind of like gated um, web page. And I was like, hey, that's kind of like not what you want to do for developers. I mean, maybe for other activities, but for developers, you kind of not want to do that. Like I had, I, I actually linked, I clicked on it because I wanted to see what's behind that. Uh, as like reading the, the content. Um, and I was sharing that back with the team, right? Because like maybe a lot of users will just get frustrated and, you know, never share that because like they maybe don't care or don't have the time or whatever. Uh, but that's kind of like where you come in, right? Like it's anything from the, anything that's out there that's like maybe marketing puts out and tries to do developer marketing, but we, you kind of like have that responsibility of making sure they do it right. They understand what are the workflows and the expectations of developers. And it flows all the way from that towards the documentation, towards engineering specific activities, anywhere from like sneak uh, CLIs, like on uh, CLI arguments and stuff like that, and how that is documented and how does it work, how people expect it to work and stuff like that. So. I've definitely had my share of feedback sharing with the team on all of those. Um, some of which I've actually had like, you know, my own contribution to like the Snake CLI and stuff like that to just help improve that. So definitely uh, the user zero feedback thing is an important aspect of this. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so what one of the things actually, we, we recently had an, an episode, our first episode actually, we did with Amir Shvat um, and uh, he's at Twitter now. Uh, and we spoke to him about, you know, he or he at least mentioned that one of the greatest values that a dev advocate would provide is, is empathy, empathy towards, you know, the users and empathy internally as well, you know, really bringing the, the, the feedback, you know, and, and bringing that feedback loop back into the product, being able to communicate it to the developers and the users and the community as well. So how do you think that, you know, Let's start with you, Philip. You know, how do you drive that feedback back into the product? You know, what does that actually look like in, in your practice, you know, day to day? I mean, at, and we at spoke about it briefly, but just, I guess, specifically, like, literally, like, how do they take something that you've kind of thought about or, you know, POC'd or tested out and kind of productize it eventually? I mean, the, I guess the, the simplest form almost is if you can create a pull request directly or even tell the community to do a pull request or open an issue for it. Um, sometimes it's maybe more complex or has more context. And then you, I don't want to say you have to create the, like the, the political weight or you need to kind of like steer a, the decision process. But sometimes this is also necessary. Like how do you even approach this or just put it on the radar of people? And so I think it depends a bit on kind of like the, the size of the problem. If it's like, oh, this is unclear in the documentation, um, I'll probably file a PR myself. But if it's like, oh, this product direction doesn't make sense or hey, this doesn't work for our users, then it's kind of like a, a much different approach because you then need to probably go to PM and convince PM like, hey, I've seen this with five users, this, this doesn't work or oh, we need to approach this. So this, there is this gap and this requires a much larger engineering effort. So I think there is like a, a scale of, sometimes you just do it yourself and sometimes you, need to advocate internally for your community uh, to do that. And the final point I want to make is I think like, everybody says like we want community feedback, but sometimes it's also a bit of a, a priority problem because you already have 10 things to do inside the company. And then you bring more feedback and say like, hey, these are the things that we also want. And then it's sometimes very hard to prioritize and make sure that you do the right thing for the community, but you also do the right thing for the product because just 10 people shout for something that doesn't necessarily give you like one single working product. So you also need to keep your own product vision in balance with everything else. Um, and yeah, it's always trade-offs. Yeah. 
And it's true. You always, you also get requirements from sales and customer success. And, you know, and there's always that like kind of tension. Everyone's pulling in a different direction. So it's, that's an interesting pick. What are your thoughts yeah. around? Yeah, I'd like to give, to like put into that maybe a bit of like kind of like the domain expertise that developer advocates have and you know, not just from like the developer centric, but actually the domain that they work on. Um, so my example is going to be about like providing security expertise to the company. So Sneak has this um, automatic PR features to upgrade dependencies. So if you the dependencies are out of date, you know, we'll kind of like pull in a, a pushing like a pull request to update it. Um, but that time when we did, kind of like pushed it out easily, like a couple of years back, um, we've seen cases in the past with uh, regards to malicious packages, which have you know, I've been kind of like studying at that time and, and writing a lot about that upgrading like too soon, kind of like immediately getting upgrades to like the bleeding edge versions that people just push out um, can actually put you in risk of like real, like real risk of malicious versions due to like maintainers getting compromised. So essentially, if you get like, you know, this pull request that says, hey, upgrade version, whatever, to 111, which is maybe the latest, you just released like yesterday or whatever, that actually maybe is compromised on the malicious version. So I actually went on to spend time in analyzing a lot of these timelines of like, what was like the postmortem, like what was the timeline of this past malicious incident? Uh, reading up a lot of security research that actually examined know, easily probably like a million of packages on NPM and stuff like that to understand what was kind of like the, uh, uh, the effect of this. And so what I came up with is kind of like, you know, pretty, you know, good study of saying, you know, by viewing past incidents of very database decisions of saying, hey, let's, let's implement like a 20 days delay of, of on the product. So 21 days was kind of like the, the sweet spot of not being upgrading too soon, but also like way not too late. And, and so the product actually took that in, took that feedback, having that security expertise in this domain, in this ecosystem. And now essentially, uh, you know, this is in, in the sneak docs and everything everywhere else, essentially they change the update from being, you know, the next day or something like that, when there's like a new uh, dependency going out to, um, to basically like a three weeks kind of period of like just a cooling time to let the community and the ecosystem kind of like fed it. And then we push uh, the automatic upgrade. So I think that's kind of like, to me, it's uh, it's very much relatable in terms of like getting that holistic view of like the developer advocacy, the impact on the users, like using the product and you know understanding the actual like domain space and you know what you should do, as well as like proactively uh, and I think empathically understanding how to help users with this uh, in a real realistic way. That's interesting. Uh, I like that. Uh, bring kind of the learning of like crowd kind of you know. Developer advocacy is eventually the intelligence of the masses as, as well. So I find that really interesting. Um, another one, you're a developer advocate. Many times you're expected to be kind of a domain expert in a certain technology when you just kind of come in and, uh, and you know, get started. But uh, how has like kind of your journey at, in, your, in your specific roles kind of enabled you to learn additional domains, hone your expertise, expertise in different technologies? Like how did you kind of expand that? Um, uh, in your, you know, current roles, I guess we'll start with Liran this time because we, uh, we always do it the other way around. <laughs> well, yeah, so I think we're always kind of like learning. This is kind of like a cycle with, um, with developer advocates. And like, if you want to be a developer advocate and like, I think, uh, if this is kind of like a career goal for you at some point, you have to be comfortable with that being comfortable. Essentially, you have to be comfortable with always learning. And it's probably true today to like even programming and learning new frameworks. But with, their, uh, you know, being a devil and a developer advocate, kind of like this is this is like an essential thing. You can't just, you know, pass on on things and say, hey, I'll learn Vue, I'll learn React the next year or whatever. This is kind of like you have to experience that because you'll be getting a lot of feedback um, and like, you know, have to support that community, maybe if that's kind of like um, where you're at. So um, for me, I think that's kind of like where it was. Like I was doing a lot of Node.js and JavaScript related um, on the server side, kind of like security um, expertise and domain and research um, and helping those kind of developers. Um, and then they did want to like also say, hey, you know, we have a lot of people doing front end development as well. Um, and I, I kind of like took myself into that journey as well and say, it's, you know, well, front-end developers think, you know, using React is secure today and safe, which it is to an extent, but it, it's not, you know, that safe. 
Um, so that was like uh, an interesting hypothesis that I kind of like uh, put for myself and said, well, let's see where it's not safe. Let's see what we can help developers like um, bridge the gap there uh, in terms of security problems. And I'm um, talking like real security vulnerabilities, not just, you know, you're missing authentication and authorization and stuff like that, like actual, you know, kind of like pitfalls, like what are the, the insecure coding practices that you're doing? Um, and, and giving those kind of like tips to people. So that essentially needed for me to like learn more about the APIs, more about things in the ecosystem. There's like a bunch of research from, um, from the folks at, at Google um, doing a, a, you know, web security stuff and, uh, and basically essentially having this kind of like a type system to help, um, to help the, the ecosystem entirely. And they've actually integrated out of this um, trusted types, that's how it's called, this mechanism oh, cool. into many frameworks that started with Angular and React. I had to like learn all of those things as well, like new standards, new specs, new things like that. Um, so that's kind of like going out of your, I think your comfort, comfort zone and safe zone and like extending to learn something else and something new. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That's cool. I think for us, it's, it's like almost two drivers. I want to say like first, um, we tend to buy other companies and then you get new con new technologies <laughs> thrown at you and suddenly you need to know more about, I don't know, EBPF and OPA yeah. and all kinds of things that are suddenly there that you should know, which is, I think you, sh you shouldn't take that as scary, but as a great opportunity to kind of like, this is the new world. This is what we need to do now. Um, the other thing is, especially conferences tend to have this hype of like, conference driven development that you always want to have like the latest and greatest um oh. and i like that i'm gonna coin that conference gotta keep up with everybody conference yeah, it's like we keep yeah. telling each other like this is what you need to do now otherwise you're not current and you cannot be here anymore um but as unfortunate as it is it seems to be almost necessary or some conferences are very much like it needs to be cutting edge otherwise we won't accept your talk so everybody keeps submitting like whatever is is new so there's this part and then there's web two four small... sorry <laughs> i was gonna say you should submit Get, something getting started four. early getting started early liran <laughs> yeah and and then there's this other thing which i have the feeling is that um if i have given a talk like 10 times i get bored of that thing myself even though it might be new to many people out there but for that myself i some at some point I have the feeling like oh i need to talk about something else because this is not exciting for me and if i don't find it exciting i don't think i can give an exciting talk about it anymore because i've talked about this to its own death so we need something fresh That's philip i totally relate to that that is so true <laughs> success hurts you're saying puts you in your growth zone you know <laughs> when you acquire all those you know it's like the musicians but who are always asked to, to play the stuff from 20 years ago and they don't want to anymore because they want to show the new stuff and then you're always like no we don't care about the new stuff we want the old classics give classic, us your greatest hits give us your greatest hits <laughs> <It's> true <laughs> When the Rolling Stones are in Israel, they like they bit the bullet and sang Angie. They're like, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> but so, you right, guys also had similar pains. Let's talk about Sneak and acquiring a bunch of different companies. So, I mean, Sneak also uh, recently yep. with the infrastructure drift, and they're doing also, uh, you know, uh, IAC, and you know, they're doing a lot of things. They have like a huge kind of uh, platform play now these days. So, do you feel like kind of similar around like kind of things that Philip spoke about that? these also kind of brought, brought in new technologies for you to discover and play around with and yeah, definitely. I think like the IAC kind of space where Sneak and like ventured into probably, you know, one and a half years ago or so. Uh, also containers, like we Sneak okay. didn't start with containers, right? Started with as an SCA, kind of like, you know, looking at your dependencies, uh, software composition analysis is the accurate term. Uh, but like, then we kind of like went into, hey, let's let's like scan a Docker file and see what's, you know, what we can tell about the base images and stuff like that. So. For me, it was also like I, I knew containers at that point, actually wrote a cool uh, Docker CLI thing, but um, uh, getting to understand like what are what developers are not understanding, that's kind of like the difficult part. That's like, it, it sounds very simple, but it's not like what do, what do developers are not understanding well? What are the, the missing, you know, the gaps that they have, right? Like understanding the, their pains and like their knowledge gaps, that's like super important to, to realize. And that's kind of like what I, I was doing also with the container part, I think. Um, that has been a very successful part on our end in terms of like, uh, I was reading some articles um, on on the internet and like, how do you build, uh, you know, secure Docker based images uh, specifically for Node.js. And a lot of them just had a lot of insecure guidelines, like, you know, do this and do that. And like, essentially like 90% of them were just like the wrong don't way of building do this, base don't images. Don't do that. Exactly. And I was like, <laughs> okay, that. I'm not gonna, 
<laughs> exactly what I uh, the simple stuff worked, but it's 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 not secure because people didn't copy paste that and just use that as like production based images. So a lot of the research has been like, how do you do those things correctly? So anything from like containers to like recent acquisitions from Snake, like Sneak Code, uh, where Sneak acquired like this uh, uh, deep code engine on like understanding uh, how do you how do you like um, uh, find um, uh, find you know a code flow from like uh, uh, from from somewhere in, in one file to something else, right? In in a in a in a sensitive function, basically a source to sync issue. Um, so like again, understanding all of those things, venturing into different frameworks and security guidelines, and understanding them and learning about them was also like essential and uh, pivotal for us. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, deep answers. So this is great to hear. I, <laughs> right. I, I, they're, I, not, I, they're not like uh, just they're giving us gems here. They're going yeah, deep. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, I, I think we got I think we got the I think we're we're already at, we're, I think we're already at the thirty minute mark. I think we're you know we got we already got to shut it down. So uh, but I, I, I do want to ask this one last question. You want to ask the one? Yeah, it's a good right. one. It's a good one. Quick quick answers. All right, go <laughs> for, go for it. All right. So one thing, this is just kind of the elephant in the room. This is one of those things that um, I oftentimes try to encourage engineers to kind of think about the transition to developer advocacy. Those who actually want to build their public persona, try something a little bit different, kind of the way that you describe it. I mean, you essentially sometimes do become like more of a generalist and, you, you know, discover a lot of different technologies. And it's it, there's something really fun about that. Uh, but one of the fear factors in that is um, kind of moving away from the actual code and engineering work. Um, and so I just want you to maybe demystify that or debunk it or tell us like kind of what your experience was in the context of like actual hands-on code and engineering. Did you feel that you moved away or do you feel like it's more of the same? Any okay, volunteer? <laughs> I'll take that, no worries. <laughs> Looking for victims here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, maybe not, but... Uh... <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think for me it was. Uh, so I think the fear is real, and I think um, most. I, I think Philip is maybe doing a bit more of like engineering hands-on stuff uh, than I am, and that that really depends on the expectation on the role and like in, in exactly like where you will be in the organization. Maybe you'll be a dev advocate who helps build SDKs and stuff like that, so you'll be very much hands-on. But essentially, the role of like transitioning from engineering related organizations to de developer relations is very different. It's totally different. For me, I've, I've done, you know, in the past, uh, I've led team, web teams, I've been a you know, tech lead, I've been a software engineer, and that's what I've done before jumping into Snake as a developer advocate. And, you know, from being a week uh, before doing, uh, you know, code reviews and doing high level and low level system design with the team, next week after I'm like doing, uh, you know, meeting customers, writing a blog post about some Ruby vulnerability stuff, like it's, it's, it's very much different. And I think maybe that maybe that's something that Philip will relate to. And that is, even when you do engineering, and I do a bunch of engineering, I think at Snake, that's like beyond, you know, the, the kind of like the average uh, developer advocate stuff. All those engineering, uh, all those engineering work is very much, it's, it's like, it's not production specific, right? Like I don't have production issues. I may be releasing tools and CLIs and libraries and whatever, but nothing of not, none of them are like, you know, very production specific. Like if something doesn't work, like I can work on it next week or something. It's not like I have on calls and stuff like that. So I don't do things related to scale or whatever. So all of those very, you know, heavy engineering scale production, stuff like that, support around the product, you know, architecting it correctly. That's kind of not something you'll probably be dealing with as a developer advocate, even if it is very engineering specific. I have to say it sounds all like upside to me so far. <laughs> <laughs> Code without production. Great. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think production still has like I I like production. So I mean, for us, production mostly means internal tooling, but or tooling. For example, we we have quite a bit of tooling running just to collect like our our reach. But also, we we recently ran our own conference where we we built our own conference platform basically because we built it all around YouTube basically. Um, so we. We have these things and we, we run them. So that's kind of like our escape hatch for those who want it. Um, so I'm, I mean, by now I'm doing way less coding also because I, I have my own team and I need to spend time on that. So it's, it's not like I, I say like, oh, I, I'm coding 10 hours a week. That would be a, a total overstatement by now. Um, but I think for many people, it's either not that bad or you find an escape hatch that some build more of the demos and some write more of the code. So I think the fear initially is real. Um, if that is really true, I don't know, because then you might be pulled in like, hey, 
Can you write the testing app for this new feature that we have written? And like there, there will be ways, I think, if you have, at least if you have a large enough organization, you have a diverse team, um, you will have quite a spectrum of people writing maybe 60% code um, to some people creating a demo every other month or so, if that's more like yeah. Yeah. alignment. So it's, it's really a spectrum. Yeah, yeah I like that. Wow, wow, what a great episode. <laughs> This was, yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys really appreciate it. I mean, we, uh, we got through a few user zero questions there, but we also needed to hear your advice and your, you know, feedback on, on just your, you know, your day to day and what you've done and what you've learned. So we know we have so much more to learn from you guys and we really want to have you back on hopefully again, pretty Absolutely. soon to hear some new updates and, and new things you've been working on uh, until then. We will see everybody at developeradvocast.com. Uh, and Liran, where can we follow you? Just on uh, Twitter, Liran underscore Dell. And Philip? Also on X Twitter. X E R. <laughs> yes, you take my last name, you do rot13 on my last name, and that's what you get. Easy. <laughs> oh my God, that's genius, Philip. Genius. I have two Beautiful. people that have uh, Twitter that starts with an X. It's you and Florian Haas. I'm Florian. Like, that's, that's, there you are. They're both that's... Austrian, by the way. And probably the same thing with him. I mean, what was that? Easy, <laughs> I see? I never tried that, actually. I should probably check. It makes sense. Now that... <laughs> Oh, you Austrian. Sharon and Sharon. And Sharon, you're at. Back this year. And Sharon, you're at. I'm. Uh, I'm actually Sharon Z on uh, on Twitter, but nobody gets that the one is the O N E. The one is so the O N E. Yes. Sharon yes. Z. Sharon Z. That's it. And I'm Maybe. and I'm at J P Hess too. So really great Fancy. having you all. JP. Sharon, JP. always a pleasure. <laughs> Always, always a pleasure. Oh, good seeing you too. Have good a wonderful out. day. Yes, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.